Very good. Excellent. We are trying to record this. We've had a couple of requests and uh, sometimes that works and sometimes things don't always go as expected. So we'll give it a try. If you know anybody that missed it and might want to learn about local seabirds and shorebirds, um, please have them check in with us. And Catherine is hosting here. Sandy Friedman and I will be doing some of the presentation. So you'll hear from both of us. We mentioned that you're welcome to use the chat function. If you have a question and Catherine or Sandy can decide if it's a question that we wanna answer right then or, or group them for a bit. And are you recording okay? Yes. Great, then I will try to share screen. And and I have there we go. You did it. Great. <laughs> We're off to a good start. So we want to look, whoops, except it's advancing without my um doing anything. That's interesting. So we're sponsored by the Coastal Stewardship Task Force here at Sea Ranch, as well as the Sea Ranch Birding Group. And so I hope that there will be some general information and some specific information, and that that will get people interested in getting involved in some of the studies. So right now, you're used to seeing a big bunch of surf scoters in the surf, but they're starting to migrate. And so in a long, low line, you may see them going to the north. We also see brant, which are a goose, not the same as a brant's cormorant. And they pass by in long lines and you often see that big white butt going by. The cackling goose or Lucian Canada goose, you'll see it go by the chin strap and the hind end, but often you'll hear the geese. It's not the same sound as the old fashioned Canada goose that many of us grew up with if we come from back east. So the migration is underway now. Some of the birds are already gone. It's fun when you look at the loons, we are seeing just the other day at tide pool, I saw Pacific loons in long low lines pouring to the north, but the common loons go in one or two at a time. So it's a little bit different pattern depending on which bird it is. Kathleen Chasey up at Iverson Cove said there were hundreds of Pacific loons sitting on the water a few days ago. There must have been a good feeding source right there. All winter, we've been watching the greaves, red necked with a little longer neck, the horned, which has clear ears at the ear patch and the eared grebe with dirty ears. You'll see the patch extend down further. You'll notice the size difference in a Western grebe versus a horned grebe. These birds are heading inland a bit. And so many of the birds are heading to Alaska. Others are going to the prairie provinces. Everybody says, I don't know any of the shorebirds, but we wanted to assure you, you do know a shorebird. You must know the black oyster catcher. And one of the fun things about this bird is it's a shorebird that he is here year round. Another local shorebird is the spotted sandpiper. This is the plumage in breeding or summer. They often nest along the river. 
but all of the other shorebirds that you're trying to get to know are heading to Alaska. They're getting spiffed up in breeding plumage, but they're on their way north. Often you look at the shape of the beak, you can see the wimbrel with the decurved bill, the willet with a straight bill, the wandering tattler, yellow legs, pretty good sized bill, and notice that he's in breeding plumage already. This was an April shot from Wacon Beach. Another April shot from Dune Drift, the black turnstones. These are the ones that seem to crawl all over the rocks. And you'll notice a surf bird in the middle of them. It's got yellow legs. It's got a two-tone bill. These are some of the types of things to look for as you're trying to distinguish one from another. The black turnstones are really distinctive in flight. So be sure to look at flight patterns as well. The peeps are what we call the little guys that run along the edge of the surf line. A sanderling is just about in the same category as the peeps, those very white birds that you see just dodging the edge of the waves. More typical of the peeps are the Western sandpiper, little bit of a droopy bill, black legs, and also least sandpipers, which have yellower legs. So you can watch for all of them. Although they're coastal birds for us, they're headed to Alaska. Alaska hosts 50% of all North American shorebirds, and that's where they go for breeding. The Copper River Delta there has a huge festival, hundreds of thousands of shorebirds are there. The other group of birds that everybody complains about are the gulls. So take a look at some differences here. The herring gull is a big sturdy gull, a lighter gray back or mantle, and the head is not clear white. Next to it, the California, the tiny mew gull, and the ring-billed gull are all in the smaller size category. And you really can't miss the Hermans gull with dark wings and a red bill. That one will be showing up later this summer. All of these others are out of the area now because what we're seeing is birds coming in now for nesting. The common murs that look like little penguins with dark heads and white bellies have been coming in and up on top of Wallala Point Island the other day, there were 200 and some standing there getting ready to nest. They've come in for the breeding season and the Brant's cormorants flying with them are certainly part of their breeding strategy as well. Very soon we'll start to see brown pelicans. I believe we've seen a couple so far and typically the first ones to come here are the adults. They've nested in Southern California or Baja. They're tired of taking care of chicks. They're out of there and coming up here to feed up for the summer. This one, however, is a juvenile. They'll be here shortly after the adults arrive. So besides looking at migration, we want to look at the locally nesting species. How are they different in their style and activities? The surveys that we do and that you could help with if you're interested and a little bit about the forms that we use. This is our Western gull. It's the only gull that's here year round. It's the only gull that nests here. 
So at this point, you're going to be pretty safe in the next few weeks in saying it's a Western gull. Everybody else is out of here. And you'll notice that little chick up there. They're here and getting ready for nesting. So we have noticed copulation and gathering of nest materials, but it'll take another week or two before we see any of them sit on a nest. And they nest all along the coast on some of the islands. You may have noticed pelagic cormorants flying by. Easy to tell it's a pelagic because of that big white flank patch. Only present in breeding season. So helpful now, but it's not going to get you through the whole year in identifying a pelagic cormorant. Those are the ones that nest on the edges of the cliffs. Beautiful iridescence in the head. Little bit of red if you have a good close-up look at the face and a very thin, we call it a pencil thin bill. As opposed to standing around on the top of Wallala Point Island primarily, the Brant's cormorant, a sizable cormorant, bigger and sturdier than the pelagic, that creamy patch is important to know about around the bill or the gular patch because in breeding season, both the males and females get this gorgeous turquoise patch that they show off. But the cream patch will be important in identifying them year round. Here are the two together. You can see a hint of the pelagic cormorant's flank patch of white peeking out of the feathers. And look at the size difference of the bills, the cream patch on the Brant's cormorant, the larger of the two. But we have one that's even bigger. This is a cormorant that doesn't nest on Sea Ranch, but they have nested just north of us at Fish Rocks. So as we look at the seabird studies that we've been doing, what we're talking about is gathering data. They started in 2007 when we had fireworks shot off from Wallala towards Wallala Point Island, and we were interested to verify that nesting birds were disturbed. And that started us on a study that's still going on to this day. So we're gathering some long-term data in the set. So at the beginning, we want to know what are the conditions we're working under? What time is it? Who's out there? Um, what are the conditions like fog or rain or weather? We count by species, we count by age if we can determine it, and we have a separate survey of nests that we see on the islands. And the three islands that we look at are Black Point, Galleons, Arched Rock, and our largest island, Wallala Point Island off the north end of Sea Ranch. In the hour or so that we're out there, we count the highest number of each species seen at one time since they come and go. And any notes of observations can be very valuable. <clears throat> so again, we work with ambient information at the top of the form. We want to know if it's a strong cloud cover, is it sunny, how strong is the wind, is it raining? What temperature is it when we're out there? So we give you options for precip, for wind speed. We also give you codes that are used to talk about the condition of the nest, what's the adult doing. So we try to give you choices rather than free form. And you'll hear some of us talk about bloy instead of saying the long word black oyster catcher. So we use species codes that are standardized. It's a four letter abbreviation. 
If the name has one word like surf bird, you take the first four letters, S-U-R-F. A two word name, common mer, you take the first two and the first two of the second word. So a komu is what we'll call it. We don't like taking the time to say double crested cormorant all the time. So with three words, we use one letter, one letter, two letters, and whoops, once in a while, there's a duplicate like herring gull and that Hermann's gull. And so a specific code is assigned in that case. So a Brant's cormorant actually is a brack. So here's your test. And I'm not going to ask you um, to shout out the answers. But think about two, two words, the first two letters of each, a bloy. It's easier than saying black oyster catcher every time. A pico is that pelagic cormorant with the white flank patch. Brown pelican, two letters of each, B-R-P-E. Here's the tricky one. The Hermann's gull gets the H-E-E-G because the herring gull would also have two letters, two letters would be H-E-G-U. So herring gets the standard abbreviation and that Hermann's with the red beak gets a special code. Pigeon guillemot, those are the pigus we talk about. And in case you're not sure what that is, here's a pigeon guillemot. Gorgeous, sleek black bird with white patches on the wings, brilliant red feet that'll show up in our nice clear water, and a very high, thin call that's a great hearing test. When it lets out that call, you can see the bright red mouth inside as well. So when we do the breeding bird survey for the hour that we're there at each of the three islands, again, we count by species. Notice the four letter codes, the pigu, the bloy, the brown pelican, B-R-P-E. We try to figure out if we can tell adults from juveniles and we want the highest number seen during the hour that we're there the highest number on the island. So here would be our count. Notice that the cormorant on the left has a creamy patch. So it's a brack. There's one adult brack. The only gull around here right now is a wegu. So we've got one Western gull and we've got a couple of black oyster catchers. I can see two, but if there's a third one to the right, it's off my screen, that's what I thought. We count by age, the brown pelican adult versus the juvenile to the left. So we want you to record whatever you see. You'll notice again, the difference in size, the taller Brant's cormorant at the top with the creamy patch of the throat and bright blue and the smaller pelagic cormorants, picos, spilling down the rock. So think about what you have here. You've got three black oyster catchers, but notice the one on the left has a two-tone bill. That tells us it's an immature. It's not full grown and mature yet. So we would record the difference, two adults and one immature. We get great clues from the notes, thing that you, things that you notice. If you've seen a pigeon guillemot carrying in a fish, it's feeding a chick in the crevice it nests in. Or you might see a chick walking around from the oyster catcher nest, but notice under the adult, there's also an egg. So you wanna record whatever you see out there. And your notes tell us about behaviors. Is the peregrine falcon, or now the bald eagle, interfering 
and changing the nesting patterns as they're feeding on birds nesting atop Willala Point Island. And we have seen the peregrine take out quite a few Western gull chicks, as well as another one that worked on common MERS. So we do want you to be accurate in the data collection. We have some guidelines. We don't want you to erase so it looks like you're changing the data. You just cross out the mistakes and keep writing. And that's why if the form looks messy, it's okay. It's a field form. You don't bother to recopy it and make it neat and tidy. And this all goes back to the time when the fireworks were in progress and we were capturing data that might have to go to court, actually. So reminders, we count the highest number at one time on the island. Zero means we looked and we saw none of that species. But if we couldn't see, or you simply forgot to look, then an X tells us that's the situation. It was foggy, or you just missed that. You watch at a nest exchange, or you watch for movement in and out to be opportunistic and get a glimpse of chicks underneath, eggs that are still there, what's happening. And then before you leave on any of the surveys, please review the sheet. Make sure that you remembered to fill out everything you wanted to put down. So on the island, and this is Wallala Point Island, again, where we have two survey points from the north and the south, the habitats of the nests or the habits of the nesting birds vary by species. Across the top of the island, the blue lines and spilling down the side on some of the ledges are where we'll find the western gulls nesting. The yellow line to a pelagic cormorant nest on the front side of the island, it hasn't been there in several years, but we have had pelagics nest on GPI. And then the dashed lines show little crevices and spots. Those are the homes for those pigeon guillemots. They fly right into the crevices and that's where they protectively put their eggs and feed their chicks. There's actually one crevice from the south viewpoint where we can sometimes see inside and see the chick as part of the nesting. And again, this is pigeon guillemots. <clears throat> so we're watching the western gulls, the wagus, and the chicks are one of our first nesters. So we do a seabird nest survey where we look at the condition of the nest, how many adults are there, what are they doing, do we see eggs, and do we see chicks? And we have forms with codes that are explained, and these are used on the island surveys for nesting. So let's look at a few pictures of the western gull. Eggs with some speckling helps to make it blend in. A little bit of a disheveled nest, even to start. And it gets worse as the season wears on. They don't put much material together for a nest. <clears throat> After about 30 days, a chick will hatch. This nest actually still has some eggs at the edge of it and a little speckled chick being watched over very carefully by the adult. The nest gets dismantled almost immediately. And that's okay because the chick is precocial, which means it hatches and it can step right out of the nest immediately. So that nest will not be followed for very long, but the chick will still get counted throughout the surveys. You can see the camouflage between 
the whitewash on the rocks and the gray rocks and the speckling of the chicks, they're well colored to protect themselves. They use the red spot on the adult's beak as a target that says, if I poke at this, maybe food will come out of the bill and it's regurgitated right into the mouth of the young bird. So they're pretty cute. Black Point uh, will have primarily Western gulls nesting on it and a few black oyster catchers. The galleon's arched rock will have Western gulls spread across it and possibly oyster catchers. And up at Wallala Point Island, quite a variety. You will see some of the other scattered rocks along our coast with a single Western gull nest. So make sure you're aware of them and protective and not disturbing them by getting too close. They're actually fed for six to seven weeks before they're able to fly. So it's a fairly long time that they need to stay protected by the adult. And we actually developed a series of photographs so that we can age the chicks based on the body size and the length of the bill. Still no good flight feathers on these birds. It's a long process. The other birds that nest on Wallala Point Island, uh, one would be the Brant's cormorant. Again, this one in breeding plumage. That buff patch, even when they don't have the breeding plumage, that's still part of your helpful ID for Brant's cormorants. Even in the juvenile, same creamy patch. So be sure you're looking for that patch. And you can see that this is not yet a sleek black bird. So the viewing angle we get from the south end of Wallala Point Island on the Bluff Trail, it's not ideal, but it gives us a glimpse of what's going on. These are all Brant's cormorants nesting in that area. And of course, one Western gull hanging out to the side. If you could go up in the air and look at the island, you would see that the colony of Brant's cormorants is way out on the Western edge of the island and out of most of our view. It's a pretty tight colony. Um, they nest just about as far apart as one neck reaches from nesting materials to the next bird's neck reach. And they'll steal materials from each other out of the well-built nest cups as well. The first year or two, 2007 and eight, we just saw Brant's cormorants out there but then all of a sudden we had some interlopers and we started seeing these penguins of the north, the common murs, the black and white birds standing together in between the nests of the Brant's cormorants. And this is what happened. This is a picture from last year. We actually had 97 nests of Brant's cormorants, and you can see the well-built nest cups of the Brant's cormorants, but standing in the middle, 2,462 common murs. Luckily for the people doing the counts, we cannot see all of them from short. That would be pretty intense, but from an aerial photo where we capture it in time we can get counts of the colony. So it still seems to be doing well. If you look at this picture, you'll see taller Brant's cormorants, a few of those black and white penguins, and notice right in the center, a half pint. It's a chick that is quite a bit smaller yet. In 2012, I think it's Carol Carr and I that were out on the bluff watching and we saw food carried in, a small fish 
carried in by the common myrrh. So we knew it was feeding a chick and could verify that that was the first nesting on the Sonoma coast. In 2012, same year down at Jenner, the common myrrhs also nested for the first time. So besides what's going on in terms of development of the eggs and chicks and how many are on top of the island, we also want to know what's going on with disturbances. So if there are natural disturbances by the bald eagle, by the peregrine falcon, by the river otters, we would like to know about that just so we can understand what's going on. And we also want to know about human disturbances. This is a picture of Wallala Point Island with, I think it was the Goodyear blimp. That, no, it was Outback Steakhouse blimp that went over and caused some disturbance. Um, there are low overflight zones over these larger islands and planes are not to be flying lower than a thousand feet. But once in a while, we do see a disturbance and NOAA would also like to know what disturbances are out there. So there is an online form uh, that you can report a disturbance, but also remember the disturbances can be up close and personal. You can walk out to the edge of the bluff and suddenly a black oyster catcher or a pelagic cormorant is right there below you. So we want to be aware of what we're doing and not adding to disturbances of the nesting. So there are some surveys that you can help with. The seabird counts and the island surveys are the ones I've been talking about. Sandy Friedman is gonna talk a lot more about the two special surveys, the black oyster catchers and the pelagic cormorants and their natural history. The picture is showing the scattering of black oyster catcher nests along the coast. So they are spread out much more than those nests atop Wallala Point Island. And I will turn things over to Sandy. Great. Thanks, Diane. I think that I have to... You have to share your screen now. Yeah. So I clicked it. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> I apologize to everybody for the noises I'm making because this makes me incredibly nervous. So let me see if I share a screen now. It's there you oh. go. So I just have to scoot down to where my slides start. Let's see. Great. Here we are. Catherine, can you see this? I can, and if you want to, you can, let's see. Uh, you probably you want to play so that it will scroll through the slides. I think I can hit these buttons. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Sandy, so, you, so it'll play the whole thing. Do you see the screen icon down on the right? You can hit that, it'll, or, it's to show the whole slideshow instead of seeing your slides with the little notes next to the left. Does that make sense? No. You can, or you can go up to your navigation on the top, go to the navigation okay. where it says slideshow. Keep going, see where it says slideshow? Slideshow. Yeah, you're almost, the, wait, go back to the top navigation. Okay. It says view, uh, slide review, show. slideshow. Yeah. Click, Click on slideshow. Okay. And go to okay. presenter view. Okie doke. Ah. Hmm. Actually, Catherine, it was the um, play from current slide. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I think you can get out of that, Sandy, if you hit escape. Escape. Sorry. On the keyboard. I have one that says end show. Should I do that? Yeah, go ahead and do that. Okay, so now go back to that slideshow and just choose the second one. Do exactly what you did. Oh, there you go. Sorry. There you go. Oh, terrific. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Sorry, I misled you. <laughs> well, I, I apologize to all of you viewers for my incompetence with a computer. Um, I'm going to mostly talk about the Costa catchers, the pledge of cormorants, and then also some about observing and monitoring. Uh, in a slightly different way than, than um, Diane has. Um, before we start, I wanted to thank Karen Wilkinson for uh, helping put this together. It, it wouldn't be here without her expertise. And I wanted to acknowledge and say how much I appreciated that. We'll start with the Blois. Um, most of you know a lot of this information, so we'll go through it somewhat quickly. Um, these are monogamous birds. There's virtually no sexual dimorphism. You'll hear people talking about their eye differences between the male and the female. It's pretty tough. Just assume you don't know which one is male and which one is the female. Uh, the behavior changes slightly, but they're both participating fully in incubating the eggs and in feeding the young. Um, they aggressively defend their territory, both their feeding territory, which overlaps with their nesting territory. Um, they nest above the high tide line, uh, which is a very limiting factor in oyster catchers and why we're so interested in studying them. Um, they feed in the intertidal zone, which may seem obvious if you think about the, the words intertidal zone. Um, so they are affected by the tides as opposed to, as you'll see, a pelagic cormorant, which is feeding out in the ocean, um, pretty much independent of the tides. It plays an important role in the oyster catcher's biology and ecology, and an even more important role in how you observe them. Um, they eat mostly mollusks, mussels and limpets. Um, they're not um, sitting on the ground waiting to be um, taken by an oyster catcher, uh, they close up. Um, you have to be quick and you have to know what you're doing. And that's why it takes the chicks quite a while to learn how to do this. We'll get into all of that more as I go through this. Um, pairs begin nesting one to three weeks before egg laying. You can see the bird on the right has some eggs underneath her. Um, if you look just above her leg, you'll see two small eggs. Um, the eggs hatch in 26 to 32 days after the eggs are laid. I think there's the eggs. Um, you'll see the male and the female taking turns incubating. Um, an interesting part to know is that eggs can be laid at 24 hour intervals, but the chicks will hatch from those eggs at four hour intervals. So some of those chicks have been in the eggs longer than others. And you'll see a size difference uh, when the uh, chicks are all together. And um, some of them, um, they compete with each other for food. And you'll see bigger chicks out feeding younger chicks. Um, it's part of the deal. Um, you hope they all make it. Um, but the chicks are in it for themselves. Um, chicks are precocial. They're well camouflaged. Um, they're often moved by the parents away from the nest site. So if, for example, ravens have been watching them um, and watching the adults sitting on the nest. Um, the chicks are then moved. There's a chick. And the ravens won't know necessarily where they've gone. Um, since foraging is done in the intertidal zone, adults forage when the tide is low enough and the food is exposed. Uh, they can't feed other times. So sometimes it's advantageous to be watching them when the tides are high so that they're on the, in the area of the nest above the intertidal zone. Um, other times you want to see them feeding. And we'll get to that more in a moment. 
Um, adults bring the food to the chicks in their beak. They place it on the ground. Uh, this is a little video. Um, it's really wonderful to watch. If you've never seen this, it's just, it's just great. And they do it over and over again. That adult will fly off and get some more food, bring it back to the chicks. Um, chicks be, begin foraging at 10 days, but it's not easy. It requires skill. Learning is slow. They're up on a rock. Their food really is down in the intertidal zone. They're just playing around. You'll see them picking whatever up. They're insects or just pieces of seed or grass or whatever. They're just learning how to do it. Um, the failure of a chick is often due to disturbance of the nest area. Um, unfortunately, human disturbance is becoming more common due to development and large demands for recreation on the coast. Um, both the bloys and the pelagic cormorants are long lived, um, 16, usually 15, 16, 17 years um, is a lifetime. So they might have 12 breeding seasons. Uh, from an adult's point of view, um, they want to live to the next breeding season. So if it comes between, um, my gosh, this peregrine falcon is here or a human or whatever is disturbing them, they might abandon the chicks in favor of saving themselves so they have another season uh, or, or many more years to, to breed after that. So disturbances are quite important and as aggressive and defensive as the boys are, they will leave. Um, and same with the, with the Picos. Um, even at 50 days old, the fledglings are still receiving more than 50% of their food from the parents. You can see that they're, they'll be watching, they'll be practicing. Here's one looking at what the food looks like and how the parent got it and is hoping that the parent will now give it to uh, the juvenile. Um, so there's an observ. What is the observational challenge in watching bloys? Uh, the chicks are small. They're they're sort of the size of a little chicken chick. Um, they're uh, mobile, so they can run around. They're extremely well camouflaged, and the parents move them away from their nest site, often out of view. Your view is very limited. Um, you're a distance away. The rocks, if you actually can, can see them, have lots of ups and downs and chicks, you know, a few inches tall. Uh, sometimes you'll see them appear and, and you think you're seeing a flat surface and what it really is is a whole series of, of rock formations in front of you. Um, so how can you observe them? Uh, one method you would think would be to be patient and wait for a glimpse. Um, that seems like uh, you know, patience is, is good. Um, but in the case of the boys, it's not very effective. Uh, here, here are two, the top one you probably saw, the bottom one, maybe not. Um, so for boys, what really works is to follow the adults. If you wanna find the chicks, you follow the adults. When the chicks are present, um, adults are feeding in the intertidal zone and um, they'll bring food back to the chicks in their beak. Uh, you can see at the end of the beak, that's not a black uh, coloration of the beak, that's a food item. Therefore, if you see the adults carrying food, they have chicks. Even if you can't see the chicks, um, the adults have shown you where they are. Let me just minimize this, sorry. Um, so once you see that, that's the time to be patient. You'll see the adult disappear often and then come out. He has no food. He's given it to a chick. Eventually, as the chicks age, they'll become more active. Uh, they're more mobile and they'll become more visible and you will see them. But you'll know that the um, chicks are there if the adults, sorry, I'm having trouble making this move. Catherine? Yeah. Okay. Um, but this this trick of finding following the adults only works if they're foraging, and they can only forage in the intertidal zone when the tide is low. 
So um, if you go when the tide is high, you'll see the boys sitting up on the island or resting, standing on one foot, uh, messing around. Um, you won't see the chicks and you'll spend an hour um, confused as to whether the chicks are there or not. Um, so you wanna go when the tide is low, but the blois aren't waiting for the absolute lowest tide. They're waiting for the food to be exposed as the tide recedes. So going before the lowest tide is when the, when the bloy are most likely to be there. Um, so I will talk a little bit about the pelagic cormorants. Um, so in this case, so are the tides important um, as they are for watching bloys? Probably not. Um, we'll talk some about the biology of the cormorants to understand um, how to effectively monitor them. Um, Diane went through some of this, so I'll go through it quickly. Um, Pico is one of three cormorant species at Sea Ranch. Um, the others, here's the brant and the um, brant's cormorant on the top left and a pico below and um, the double crested. Um, picos are exclusively marine, but the name is a little misleading since while they're called pelagic cormorants, they prefer inshore areas. Um, they don't disperse widely from where they're born. They eat mostly, this will be relevant in a moment, they eat mostly mid-sized fish. Um, their maximum foraging range, you'll see them fly away from the, from the coast and disappear. That maximum foraging range is about five and a half miles. Um, the maximum diving depth is about 46 yards. So they're very strong swimmers and they're diving, they can dive quite deep. And sometimes you'll see them diving, um, you know, from the shoreline, you'll see them diving and they may come right up and sometimes they can stay down for as much as two minutes. Um, they're, they have large thigh and hip muscles. They have strong web feet and they have um, special feathers that allow air to escape to decrease buoyancy. You're always thinking of animals holding air. Uh, they're trying to get rid of the air, which is helpful in diving. Um, it's not helpful in other ways. As we'll see, there's always a trade-off. Um, they have a high energy need and um, so they need to eat. They need to eat a lot and often. Um, like the Blois, they're long lived up to 17 years. And we'll get into this a little bit more. Um, Picos build nests on narrow, high, steep, inaccessible um, cliffs. Um, they look for, you can look on the cliffs and you'll see guano and look for narrow ledges. And if you're lucky, you'll also see picos. Um, the picos particularly say in the galleons area where uh, it forms almost like a horseshoe or an L shape, you can get on top of the cliff where the picos are nesting below. So um, you wanna be careful um, about how aggressive you are in order to see them. It's best to, and you'll, you'll as Diane said, um, you'll be, the birds will tell you that they're not happy with you. Um, we, we really stress that you take that message seriously. And if, if the birds are, are seeing you and their behavior indicates they're seeing you, then that's the time to move away. Um, and some birds come in early. Some of you may have seen even in February and March, picos seeming to nest. Um, they're, it's pretty common they'll return to their um, nesting sites to ensure the one that they want, sort of like getting there early. Um, their nests are mostly grasses and seaweed and guano and it forms a cement and um, it's pretty cool. Here's a, a short video of, of a pico sitting on a nest and um, you'll often see them doing a lot of behavior that's independent of them moving around. If they're, if they're hot, you'll see they're panting. Um, the more 
the closer they get to a nest exchange where they can go off and feed, the more they'll be looking around. It's sort of like, um, you know, if you're waiting for a bus um, and it's supposed to come in 15 minutes, you're just sitting around. If you get to the time when it's right about the time for the bus to come, it's more likely you're going to start looking down in the direction of the bus. And eventually, if it's late and you're late, you're going to be looking a lot and you'll see the picos starting to look agitated and looking out at the horizon, hoping that their mate comes so they can go off and feed. Um, as I said, the, the males and the females share the incubation. It's again about 30 days. They may uh, produce one to four eggs. Um, they'll take turns um, in attending to the, uh, especially in the beginning, attending to the um, eggs and the young chicks. Uh, you'll rarely see a, a, nest, a nest left unattended. Um, the unattended nest the eggs and the chicks are subject to predation, principally by uh, ravens. Um, and also, they may get cold. Um, but as with the bloys, push comes to shove, these are long living birds, and they will leave the nest if they get hungry enough. And you'll, you'll see this happen occasionally when the fish out in the ocean aren't as abundant as we might like. Um, observing nest exchanges is an important part of watching picos and because um, it, it, it tells you a lot about um, that they're the male and the female are in tune and are trading places. Um, so here's a, a obvious question maybe. Would you expect chips, chicks born on a cliff edge to be precocial like the ploy chicks or altricial undeveloped, requiring care by parents like robin chicks. Um, you can imagine if they were precocial like a bloy chick that can run around or a gull, a western gull, um, they might end up um, taking an unfortunate dive. Um, so even though they're in the egg about the same time, the bloy chick is a precocial is ready to go. Uh, pico chick is altricial, very undeveloped. Um, they're naked, they're helpless, um, they're just skin, there's no feathers, or not, not that you can see. You, and you'll see in these two, um, pretty chicks pretty early on. Um, both parents um, provide food to the chick by regurgitation. Um, chicks feed by inserting their head into the mouth of the parents. It's quite a scene uh, that they're often two to four chicks in the nest. They're all competing to get their head inside the mouth of the parent. They're waving their heads back and forth. The parent looks annoyed. Um, and it, it's, it's quite a scene. If you haven't seen it, it's, it's um, they, put on a, they put on a great show. Here's a small video of really young chicks. But as you'll see in the next few slides, um, you know, as they get, Here's two, um, the two at the bottom. The bird on the left is a juvenile, has a gray feathered head. You can see it's almost as big as the adult, if not as big. Um, so they grow quickly um, from that very uh, small stage. But even at this stage, they'll be trying to get the adult to feed them by sticking their head in the adult's head. and. Um, the ones behind them are slightly younger. You can see it's not feathers. They have more down on their head and they might be a, a week um, younger. Um, what we found with the Picos, both here at Sea Ranch and elsewhere is that individual years vary significantly in breeding success. You'll have great years and you have terrible years. Um, believe that food availability is, is um, significant in regulating these populations. Um, wa warm water events occur. They affect hatching and fledgling success because of the sudden and severe declines in prey available, availability. Um, it's not a constant 
supply as some other birds are feeding on. It goes up, they have great years, and it goes down, and the populations decline. Um, predation is important, but it's sort of a secondary in that predation is related to limited food supply. Yes, you'll see ravens go after um, pico chicks when the adults are still on the nest, but often they're predating when the adults are forced to leave to go feed for themselves. Um, ravens can be very clever and it's, uh, it's exasperating watching chicks that you've, you've been watching for weeks or, or more than a month and ravens are coming in and harassing and eventually sometimes forcing a, an adult to leave the nest and another one comes swooping in and grabs a chick or, or an egg. Um, but here's some examples of data we've collected here at Sea Ranch. And you'll see 2014 was a very good year. We had um, 85 fledglings. Um, six years later in 2019, five. Um, that's, <laughs> that's a pretty significant change. And you can see it was gradual from 85 to 73, 46, 10, down to five. And then last year, it came all the way back to 71. Um, even though we only had 54 nests, as there were fewer birds left than in 2014, where some of those birds over the years aged out, moved on, died. Um, and yet we still had 71 fledglings. This year, unfortunately, so far, isn't great. And um, usually the, the, the flows of up and down are more gradual. And so we'll have to see what happens this year. And that's why it's, it's so valuable to be collecting this, this data um, year after year, um, making an assumption that while well, everybody's fine, um, doesn't allow you to really understand what's happening. Um, so the observational challenge with Blois is a difficulty finding the chicks since they're small and mobile. With picos, you know where the eggs are, um, you know where the chicks are, they're, they're in the nest. The chicks can't leave the nest and the nest is visible on a ledge. So it seems, you know, as I say, what's the problem? And it's all about the adults again. For ploys, the adults take us to the chicks. For picos, the ad adults are on top of the nest and the chicks and the eggs are under them. Um, there's, there's a small chick just peeking out of the side. So um, you won't see the eggs or the chicks unless you wait for an adult to stand. And sometimes they don't stand uh, for long periods of time. You might watch for an hour and the bird is perfectly comfortable sunning itself and just sits. Um, so adults will stand for nest exchange and sometimes they'll stand just to move around, stretch, change position. Um, the eggs have to be moved and they'll get up and move the, move the eggs. But um, you really have to be patient, especially at the egg stage and at the young chick stage. Sometimes the chicks are under there, but they're not moving about. They'll start moving that because um, they're getting hungry or they just, they're chicks. And so in the case of the Picos, uh, patience is the key. You have to wait for the adults to stand. It's the only, it's the only way to get the information you need. Um, and we try to organize the observations so that um, in locations where there are multiple nests, then we try to have more observers um, so that we can get lucky basically and see a nest exchange or just see a bird stand up. As the chicks get older, this becomes less important. The chicks are moving all the time and eventually are still in the nest area, but are standing on their own. Um, we've been monitoring um, Blois and Picos um, actually since 2013 for the Picos and the Blois since 2011. Um, the Blois are part of a 10-year statewide effort led by Audubon, California to assess Blois populations on our coast. Um, 
because boys are limited to nesting above the high tide line, um, as ocean waters rise, the number of suitable nest sites diminish. Um, and so we've, this 10 year study was to see how boy populations are being affected by rising waters due to climate change. Um, boy populations are, as I said before, sensitive to human disturbance and up and down the California coast as populations grow, development and recreational demands on the coastal ecosystem also grow. And we have a, an example right here at Sea Ranch. And you know, while we endeavor to be part of the solution, um, you know, honestly, um, we live on the coast. We're part of recreation and development. And um, so we're part of the problem and we try to minimize that. Um, but as you can see, even in the discussion of the closing of the tide pool stairs, um, those boys have had a great deal of human disturbance from people climbing on those rocks and haven't succeeded in a number of years um, because of that. And so we're both trying to be part of the solution by collecting data and protecting habitat, um, we are also um, contributing to their disturbance. Um, this 10-year program is completing this year, um, but we will continue collecting data um, and sharing it with others. Um, we've been monitoring PICO since 2014. Um, this isn't part of a formal survey, but we do share with others the data we collect. And um, again, species like picos that have fluctuating populations are particularly vulnerable to changes in the ecosystem, like, uh, for example, the decline of the kelp beds doesn't give cover to fish. And that means that fish aren't there and the picos may have to go fly further to find food and be further away from the nest. And so, uh, the data is really helpful in having a quantitative uh, evaluation of how these um, species are doing and not an anecdotal, I think there are fewer picos this year, or I don't, it seems like years ago we'd see more of this or that. And those kinds of, of observations are often um, um, mistaken it's the, the data doesn't always support your memory. <laughs> and it's the memories that's the problem, not the data. Um, so we, we monitor the picos and bloys throughout the nesting season. Um, for bloys, this is coming up. Uh, they're just starting in the next week or so to, they're already in their territories. They'll be starting to um, look for nest sites and start to build their um, very, minimal nests and uh, picos have already started. Um, they're not done, but some are sitting on eggs. We haven't seen any chicks yet. Um, and as Diane said, these there are a number of, of things that we're looking for. Um, Perhaps those of you that haven't done observations or used the forms, et cetera, it may seem a little bit imposing. Um, there's a lot of, it looked like, whoa, this is beyond my capability. I don't want to get into this. Um, it, it's, it's, really, um, it's really very easy to do. Um, you get lots of help. Uh, the forms are, are well made and mostly self-explanatory. Um, there are lots of other observers that have done this. Um, almost all of us came with no experience at some time and um, picked it up very quickly. Um, doing the observations, in my view, it's, it's interesting. I have a great time. It's rewarding contributing to the base of knowledge um, and the preservation of our coast. And, um, you know, people, observers, for one reason or another, come and go. Um, some people, age out of Sea Ranch, some people move, um, some people find other interests. So we're always looking for new observers and new monitors. 
And the more that we have um, in cases like um, the PICOs, then one group may not see a particular group of nests. And so if we have backup people, then they can go and instead of surveying all 28 nests, for example, they may focus on the five that the previous group where the, where the adult never stood up. And so just watch those. And so the more observers we, we have, the, the better. And it doesn't, um, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to have a PhD, um, just um, an interest and um, some commitment. Um, the other thing that you learn, which I like to emphasize, it's a little hard to explain by doing these observations, is that you learn that by watching the behavior of the animals and understanding it's that understanding the biology informs you about the behavior, which allows you to understand how to observe the animals more effectively. So even those of you that just want to be casual uh, coast walkers and enjoy the seabirds or um, do birding out in the woods, um, by following some of these examples that I've just given, uh, relating the biology of the bird and its ecology, uh, you'll inform, you're informed as to how to most effectively see them and interpret what you're seeing. Um, so you won't find yourself um, at high tide waiting and watching for boy chicks. You'll know to come because you'll know that they feed and they have to feed their young and therefore it has to be done at low tide. So um, my name and email is on the screen. If you have questions, you're welcome to email me. If you'd like to consider being an observer and want to uh, have questions or wanna go out and uh, do some viewing um, so you can see what this is like, um, shoot me an email. I'm coordinating both the PICO and the Bloy observations um, this year. Um, uh, Cheryl Harris, who many of you know, organizes uh, birding um, here at Sea Ranch. And if you're interested in joining her and others, um, you can contact her as well. And of course, Diane is always available to um, answer your questions and help you find the right place to um, enjoy seabirds here at Sea Ranch. So I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you for attending. This is, um, we really appreciate your participation in these programs. Um, we, d uh, we ha had a couple of questions in the chat room that have been answered uh, by Diane and Karen, uh, but I thought I would sh um, share um, the question from, um, let's see, Paul Nuichek asked, said, we are new to Sea Ranch and saw pelicans migrating north in the fall. Where were they headed and when will they return? Um, and Diane already replied to, um, his questions um, with, for the brown pelicans, they breed early in the year in Southern California and Baja. As they finish, we begin to see them up here. They spread all along the West Coast to follow the food. In the fall, they head back down the coast, staying sometimes as late as December, then time to nest again and be in the far South. Uh, and at the quest, there was a question early on about uh, uh, what was the third kind of cormorant, and that question was answered at the double-crested cormorant, cormorant. But I don't see any other questions in the chat. Um, does anyone have any last-minute questions they would like to ask Diane or S Sandy? I am not seeing any. If uh, Jill, yeah, I had a question. Um, is there an estimate of how many pairs um, 
our breed. Well, oh no, never mind. You had that chart. I was trying to think of how many breeding pairs of uh, of blois were mm. common on the sea ranch, but that chart showed that varies every year. The chart. Let's see. The, the chart, chart mostly showed people. fledglings, successful well, we, or not. I but think last. I think it's generally around twenty-two or twenty-three nesting okay. pairs. All right, thank you. For oyster catchers. For oyster catchers. Right, the right. oyster catchers. Right, Around 22, I think, 23. I think the chart may have been geared more to the cormorants. Okay. Um, but yeah, black oyster catchers, it's just, it's just 22, 23 nesting pairs. More or less consistently mm -hmm. each year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pretty so far, so, I mean, we're getting surprises this year, but so far mm -hmm. that's been about so not only are the number pretty consistent, but where they nest mm -hmm. is pretty consistent, but they may take a year off and not that pair may not nest in a given year. So what's great at this time of year is if you're walking the bluff and see a pair of oyster catchers or see a nest, let us know because there could be a new spot. There could be a pair that looked around but hadn't found a spot last year. So you can be really helpful in having more eyes out on the coast if you're watching and just send an email. We can help check it out. Send it to Sandy or, um, or me and we'll get the info out to look okay. for it. I'm, I'm usually out at, you know, reefs where there are mussel beds at low tide just because I'm out free diving and looking at what's under the water at low tide. And so I'll see them, but I've not stopped to watch. And of course, it's early for breeding, so I wouldn't have seen a nest. But I usually just once I see them, I try to duck out of the way because I've obviously sure. disturbed whatever they were doing. Great. Yeah, and where you're seeing them feeding may be close or may be quite a ways away from the nest. We know we see them all the time around Green Cove, Smuggler's Cove, right. Green Cove, and yet we've never found a nest in that immediate hmm. area. So if the rocks aren't high enough to stay above mean high tide, they're not gonna wanna nest there. And that's what happens in certain stretches good feeding, but not necessarily good nesting spots. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or were, I think- Yeah, Diane, I, ha I have a question uh, about nesting location. How do the oyster catchers or Western gull they pick the same spot on like mm -hmm. galleons. How do, are, are they the juveniles from the previous years that they come there or do they just pick the place? Chances are good. We're seeing a lot of adult pairs. These are birds that live for quite a few years. They may not nest every year or they may not be successful every year, mm. but a lot of the adults are coming back to the same places. Okay. okay. And some of them, the oyster catchers, many of them, even though in the winter we get lots more oyster catchers here who may hang out in gangs of 14 or 16 that have mm -hmm. come from points much further north because the oyster catchers nest as far north as Alaska. They may not all stay there for the winter. They may nice. come south, but our adults are often hanging on to their territory and making sure they still have that territory okay. and others are staying. Yeah, there. that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Mesame, you'll see them not only at the same location like Arch Rock, but actually exactly in the same nesting the spot. Yeah. Within a, yeah. Within a few inches of. The, where they were the previous year. Yeah, that, that's true with the cormorants that are on the bluff there. It, they're all the same nest. Yep. As they mm -hmm. were last year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Diane. That was very good. Great, thank you. And thanks to everybody that signed in. If you've got other questions, feel free to send them to Sandy or Cheryl Harris or me. And if you are interested to help in the surveys, please contact Sandy. And we'll see you out on the bluff. Great. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Good night. That's right. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine and Karen. Oh, Diane. Mm -hmm. um, Sh uh, Sharon Vilnai asked, is there a good map of these locations where these nests are? Do we have a good map? Not that we, not that we publish, certainly. Um, if you live in a particular area or if you walk a particular area, we'd probably be happy to chat with you about where to look for them. But they're, the oyster catchers are spread out from Black Point area up to, up through, well, up through galleons. And then they pick up again. There's maybe not a high enough spot, but then north of Green Cove, up through tide pool beaches, you'll see several different nests. And then there's another gap where there don't seem to be high enough rocks. Um, and Lala Point Island is a good spot. Well, I would mention that there is a there is a map in the blow in the 2020 report, report about black oyster catchers that Carolyn Carnell prepared for Madrone Ottoman and California Ottoman. Uh, and that report, Sharon, is on the Sea, the, um, sea Ranch members website under the Coastal Stewardship Task Force page. There, that report appears there. And there is a map of the, of the black oyster catcher nesting sites in that report. But we don't have an equivalent for the Picos. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. All right. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you.